This is Les Couilles sur la Table, a podcast where we are having real conversations with scholars and experts about men, manhood and masculinities from a feminist point of view. My name is Victoire Tuaillon and I am a journalist. For more than two years now, I have been hosting this podcast. With each guest, we try to answer questions like, what does it mean to be a man nowadays? How is it possible that our world is still built by and made for men? What effects does masculinity have on art, music, movies? In this episode, I will talk with the American feminist and psychologist Carol Gilligan about love and masculinity. Carol Gilligan is a pioneer of gender studies. She spent her career examining the developmental differences between boys and girls and how those differences can both support and subvert our relationships. Last year, she published with Naomi Snyder a book called Why Does Patriarchy Persist? And I found this book absolutely brilliant because it examines how traditional views of what a real man is and a real woman is affect our ability as humans to create and live deep relationships. If it's easier for you to understand, you'll find the complete transcript of this episode on our website, binge.audio. Hello, Carol Gilligan. Hello. You noticed, I mean, everybody notices that there is an asymmetry between boys and girls, even nowadays, in the way we raise them, in, in what we expect from them. And so can you explain how do typical boys develop psychologically nowadays? Well, the, the, the really striking asymmetry, and it's so interesting because it was noticed or at least written about first, in the middle of the 19th century. And it was, when are times in development when girls and boys seem to become more vulnerable? In other words, their resilience, you know, like ability to withstand stress or to bounce back from stress, like an immune system. Their resilience was at heightened risk. And what was noticed, it, it was first written about in the 19th century was for boys this happens in the move from early childhood to middle childhood between ages four and seven where among boys at that age you see more signs of depression I mean sort of like kind of flat emotional and you have this sudden outburst of Attention problems, speaking problems, reading problems, out learning of control, problems. learning problems, out of control. I mean, anyone today who works in schools, you ask, where do most of the school services go in elementary school? They say to boys. No question. Trouble learning to read, trouble, all of this. Girls, as a group, do really comparatively well, often very well, up until adolescence. And it's so interesting to me. No one comments on this. Nobody says, how come? How come? How come? How I mean, come boys have problems between the age of four, four and, and seven? seven? And how come? What's, how, what's going on with the girls? Nobody asks. But everybody knows that when you reach adolescence, that suddenly you have a sharp rise in the rate of depression among girls. And then you have eating disorders, and you have cutting, and you have various forms of self-destructive behavior. And here is this big fact that's been sitting in the psychology literature since the middle of the 19th century. And most people speak as if this fact doesn't exist. So where my research came in was really to say, how come? What explains this? that boys are more vulnerable as young, at, in this four to seven, then suddenly with girls around adolescence, there's a sudden heightened risk to their resilience. And then later in adolescence, you see with boys again. And that's when you have a high incidence of suicide and other forms of violent behavior. And, against others. Yeah, Rather exactly. than against themselves. No, both. Both. I mean, you know men commit suicide may, much more often than women. So the question that I was, is, was, how come? So then here is, with my students at Harvard, we did 10 years of studies of girls' development. And what it came up with 
was as girls reach adolescence, they suddenly see this resistance in the girls as this culture of gender, of dividing girls into good girls and bad girls and all of this, suddenly this culture based on a gender division of what is masculine and what is feminine and how can what should girls do, you see this resistance on the part of girls that led me to write about what has been called development is really better spoken about as an initiation. And that's when the word patriarchy came into my, that girls were resisting an initiation into patriarchy. And that led to the question about boys. Don't boys resist too? And so that's when I thought, wait a minute, what's happening in this four to seven-year-old time? So with my then student, Judy Chu, a brilliant researcher, uh, we began to observe a group of four-year-old boys. In, in the U.S., it's called pre-kindergarten. And Judy followed these boys as they moved from pre-kindergarten to kindergarten and into first grade. And this is in her really beautiful book called When, when Boys, boys Become, become boy, Quote Boys. boys yes. So here's the finding of the book. She noticed with the four- and five-year-olds is how attentive, how authentic, how articulate, and how direct they were, these boys were, with one another and with her. And over the three years of the study, she saw how they were gradually becoming more inattentive, more inarticulate, more inauthentic, and more indirect with one another and with her. And she talked about how their relational presence was replaced by relational posturing or pretense. And she said that she was describing what happens when boys become, quote, boys, or how boys are often said to be. But it's not how they were when they were four and five. And then she said, boys know more than they show. So in other words, what she saw was these little boys resisting an initiation or trying to find strategic ways to deal with the pressures as they entered school to demonstrate that they were one of the boys in a masculinity that was defined as the opposite of and in opposition to femininity. So girls were... Femininity was seen to be nice. So, so the boys, boys had, to had to be, be mean. And these boys formed a team called the Mean Team. And the purpose of the Mean Team was organized in opposition to the girls to demonstrate that you were a boy, meaning you were not a girl and you were not gay. And the function of the Mean Team, in one of the fi as one of these five-year-olds says, was to bother people. <laughs> In other words, you had to demonstrate that you were not nice, meaning you were not like a girl. You would bother people. And to be a boy, you had to be a member of the mean team. And that's and, her book. And then we'll talk about later because another former student of mine, now a colleague, Niobe Way, did this study about adolescent boys and their friendships. And the book is called Deep Secrets. And I tell you, the deep secret is that boys are humans. <laughs> so now we talk about the boys between the age of four and seven. And so they learn how to be boys according to the rules of masculinity. Exactly. And how does learning this and pretending, how does it hurt them? Well, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a big irony. Just to give you a sense, I mean, the little boys, the four and five-year-olds, The level of their emotional intelligence is really stunning. So one little five-year-old says to his mother, Mama, why do you smile when you're sad? So he's reading her smile. He realizes the smile is covering her sadness. So he's reading the emotion that's being hidden. by. The And another five-year-old, his father, who had been hit by his father, had vowed he was not going to do that with his children. So one day, the parents are divorcing. There's a lot of tension in the house, and the little boy does something, and the father hits him. And the next day, he says, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do this. 
I'm going to promise you I will try never to hit you again. Uh, The little five-year-old says to the father, you are afraid that if you hit me when I grow up, I'll hit my children. So he has read what the father's fear is. So you have to start out with boys are human beings, meaning they begin with an amazing ability to pick up the emotions in the world around them. And then they lose it. And then the fact is that to be emotionally intelligent and sensitive is associated with being a girl. So they have to shield it. They don't lose it. They hide it. So they have to act as if they don't care, as if they are not bothered by how they affect other people. That's like being mean. That's, and because otherwise they are called girly or gay. So what Judy Chu writes in her book is that there is a real irony because in their desire to have relationships with the other boys and to be one of the boys, they shield the very qualities that would allow them to get close to the boys. So they stand in in their attempt to prove they're one of the boys. They hide those qualities that are in fact part of their humanity that would allow them to have the relationships they desire. Now, that's really interesting because it's saying that these little boys are up against a choice that is going to force them, in the name of masculinity, to lose what they desire. And what they need. And what they need. Because, you know, more and more of the research now shows it's not only that it's what we want to love and be loved and everything— But, you know, not having relationships is as bad for your health as smoking cigarettes. I mean, it it can... Longevity, to live long, to not be sick. The relationships are probably one of the most important things. And the number of men who don't have relationships other than maybe the one love relationship, a marriage or something, is much higher. So it's, in a sense... I mean, the price men are paying for this construction of masculinity is is, very high, is huge, and violence is part of that. Then boys become teenagers. Yes. And then what happens? Well, what happens is, I mean, and this is so interesting because, you know, with teenagers, when you become a teenager, first of all, you have this flood of hormones. (laughs) So you have all these feelings that you haven't had before. And also you develop the capacity for what we call subjectivity, which is becoming very self-reflective. You become interested in yourself and, you know, your experience and your emotions and so forth and so on. Those qualities that had been hidden in the little boys to become boys suddenly come to the surface again because they are not lost. They don't disappear. They're there. So they come out again. And Niobe Way, in her book, Deep Secrets, Boys' Friendships and the Crisis of Connection, has these did this study with hundreds of boys across all kinds of ethnic and race and class differences, talking about the importance of their friendships with other boys. And their friendships in which these boys, it's not that they just watch sports or, you know, hang out together. They tell each other their deep secrets, their feelings, they're the way... Usually, psychologists had described friendships between girls. And the boys would say, if you don't have someone to sell your secrets to, you would go wacko, you'd go crazy, or you would get angry, or you would, you know, you would be lost, and you need to have a friend to tell your secrets to. Well, in the course of her study, as the boys in high school went from being freshman year of high school, that's around 13, uh, to... Or 14 to 17, 8, by the end of high school, three quarters of the boys no longer had a best friend who had had a best friend. And they would say things like, Why would I tell my secrets to anyone? Why would I trust anyone? With Why my would secrets? I need anybody? I'm not, I'm not a girl. I mean, in other words, emotional intimacy had taken on a gender, feminine, and a sexuality, gay. So, Even when these older boys would describe a friendship, they'd say, no homo. In other words, but most of them, you know, it's like, I'm learning how to be a man. I I don't need to have close friendships. 
Even though that three years earlier they'd said, if you don't have close friendships, you go crazy, you'd be angry. So, so at 13, yeah. they are, most boys are conscious that they need intimate relationships. And they have them. And they have them. Yes. And then over the course of three years, they lose their friends. Yeah. And they have, what, fake friends? They have, oh, they because have, they still have or, friends. It's more more superficial friendships, not friendships where the... And you know, in our book, Why Does Patriarchy Persist? I mean, uh, Naomi um, Snyder and I, we open our book by writing about Adam. Now, Adam is a third-year law student. In his final paper for the seminar on resisting injustice is what the seminar, he wrote his paper about his own betrayal of love, and he talked about his friendship with Ollie, that they had been best friends, this boy Ollie and Adam. Growing up, they played on the same soccer team, and Ollie was the one person outside his family that Adam told that he liked to sing because... Adam was a jock. And a jock is, is a, a sports, sports. Sport, a sports yes. guy. <laughs> and so uh, when he told this to Ali that he was going to try out for a singing role in the school play, they spent, Ali said, they spent the whole day, they made a stage with cardboard boxes cut out and th that Adam would practice his singing. So they were really, really close and sharing their secrets with one another. And then Adam talks about how in 10th grade, that means when he was around 15, oh, some of the girls that he knew told him what he suspected, which is that Ali was gay. And Adam broke his friendship with Ali, which he says now was the greatest regret of his life so far. And he talks about when he was 16 or something, his grandfather said to him, do you have a best friend? And Adam said, I used to, but I don't anymore because he felt he couldn't be friendly with a gay boy and be recognized as a masculine, we would say, jock guy. So he gave up his love for Ollie and his love for singing in the name of masculinity. So men sacrifice a lot of human needs yes. and abilities and qualities for to preserve their masculinity. Yeah. And you know, they betray what they love, what they love in order to establish themselves as masculine. And it's interesting that this surprises us because then you think, wait a minute, isn't this the story of Abraham and Isaac? That to prove for Abraham to prove his devotion to God, a patriarchal God, he has to be willing to sacrifice his son that he loves. Isaac. Or Agamemnon the Greek general, to get the wind to carry his army to Troy to restore Greek honor, he has to be willing to sacrifice his daughter. So we have in our culture that men have to sacrifice love is the price for being high masculinity. You also show in your book how girls have to sacrifice their love, but in a very different way. But maybe we can just briefly sum up like how girls and women have also to sacrifice a part of themselves right. in order to be perceived as feminine. As good women or the kind of girl that people like to be with. Girls have to sacrifice an honest voice and learn not to say what they really feel and think. I that's, mean, that's what they need to sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, I give you one quick quote, which mm -hmm. is, this is a 17-year-old girl who's the top student and very popular and has gotten into the high college and everything. And she says, if I were to say what I was feeling and thinking, no one would want to be with me. My voice would be too loud. And then she says, but you have to have relationships. So the price for having relationships was to mute her voice, not say what she really feels and thinks, which meaning she couldn't be present in these so-called relationships. But that's surprising because you, I mean, we were talking how about how having close relationships and close friends is a girly thing. So girls, I mean, they tell each other secrets and, and they have close relationships. But at the same time, they're not supposed to say what they really feel or think. So what is it then, these feminine friendships? Well, that's the right question. <laughs> the thing is that girls themselves ask that question. I mean, they're aware that if you don't say what you feel and think, it's not authentic. It's a fake relationship. It's, it's not a real relationship. And, you know, as the healthy body resists infection, the healthy psyche resists the initiation into patriarchy 
whatever gender you are, because it's going to force you to sacrifice, basically, your desire to live in close connection with yourself and other people. It will force you to sacrifice relationships. And you can say, if you want something that's a little bit schematic, you can say we're all, as humans, we're born with a voice and with the desire and ability to engage responsively with other people. And that with boys, the voice goes into violence, and with girls, the voice goes into silence. Men's violence or threat of violence and women's silence maintain a patriarchal order. So they work together. Yeah. We work together. Women by being silent. Right. And men yeah. by being violent. Yes, or threatening violence, yeah. They are responses to the initiation into a patriarchal culture which requires a sacrifice of, of relationship and of love in order to maintain various hierarchies, whether of race, gender, sexuality, you name it. Yeah. And if you say it's a sacrifice of love on both sides, I mean, for everyone, that's a huge price to pay. So the question we ask is, how, why do people exactly. pay this price? Exactly, because we all need it. And, that's and the we main, all want it. We all want it. We all need it. Right. Also, for girls, it's okay to say, and for women, it's okay to say that they're looking for love and they're longing for love. But we're going to talk a bit later about, about love. So that's something feminists have always said, and of course I agree with it, and that's something that we showed again and again in, in the podcast, is that patriarchy harms both men and women right? by forcing men to act like they don't need relationships. Oh, absolutely. I'm independent. I don't need anybody. I mean, even... even I'm if, not a baby. I'm not a baby. I don't need to tell my secrets to anybody. I don't need to be close to my lovers. I don't need... Uh, I just, I need just sex. want sex. Yes. I just want sex. I don't want intimacy. Yeah. That's something you hear a lot of men say. Oh, yeah. And the, the women just, you know, they get tired of women because they always, women are asking, how are you feeling? And, and how are you? Right. And, and it's like, what? Yes, I know. I know that. Okay. But what's interesting <laughs> is that also what you show is that somehow we all benefit psychologically from patriarchy. We, we pay a very high price. We right. sacrifice a lot of things, but at the same time, by not experiencing authentic, genuine love. We protect ourselves from loss. We, we protect ourselves too. That's, right. that's a way of protecting ourselves. And that, that was the big discovery that led to our book, yeah. Yes, and so I would like now to, to talk a bit about that, is that, so you say that, because the title of your book is Why Does Patriarchy Persist?, Well, patriarchy, that's what you say, is a defense against loss. Right. And that's so sad. It's, And it's so sad. It is so sad. I mean, we so, give up and then, but it's so quintessentially human. We give up what we want most, which is love, because we're so afraid of loss. So we prefer not to be loved rather than risking to lose it's, love? Because we don't think we could survive loss. But uh, maybe you can explain what you meant by, by this, by this fear of, of loss. Well, first of all, to love somebody, to want somebody, to want to be with somebody is to be vulnerable. You can be hurt by them. If they reject you? If they reject you, if they say, you know, I like you, but I really don't love you. <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, you expose yourself to rejection You expose yourself to loss. Maybe they would leave you. They say, you know, I can't deal with this relationship. I just can't deal with it. And if you, particularly if you've, if you've been hurt before, or if you've had some experience of loss and feeling helpless, you think, you know, even though I want this, I can't deal with it. I can't risk it. It's too. I can't. I. I just can't. Or you minimize the loss. I mean, I go back to Adam, who gave up his relationship with his best friend because he didn't want to be seen as a gay boy. You know, and he thought if his best friend is a gay boy, people will think he's gay. So he gave it up as if that would not hurt him. As if, like, well, I'm 16 now and I'm, you know... I'm a man. Why do I'm a man... You know, when I was a little boy, I had friends, but I don't need that kind of friendship anymore. And what he says at the age of 26, he's a third-year law student now, is 
That is the greatest regret of my life mm-hmm. so far. So it's men are taught to minimize the price of the loss. It's like we were saying before. Oh, you know, people will say, oh, there's so many women in the world or so many other men in the world. I mean, you know, you don't need them or, you know, you're anyway, you're a man. You can stand on your own feet. You're not a baby. I mean, you're independent and so forth. Well, the fact is we're all interdependent as humans. That's the reality. Or women will say, you know, I've been hurt by love, so now I have a job and I have an income and I can support myself. Why would I expose myself to this again? And the sense is, I mean, we sort of know this. You're giving up something you want and you're paying a huge price. So that's that complements the... I mean, the mainstream explanation on of why does patriarchy persist is that, and we said it also in this show, is that when you have privilege, you don't want to give it up. Right. So patriarchy well, gives men a lot of privilege. Right. And that's one of the explanations. But also, it's it's it it persists because the because everybody wants it to to persist because it it protects us against loss. Loss. That's because what we say is. You know, first of all, nobody does something for no reason. So, I mean, like, let's just take Adam again. He gives up his relationship with Ollie because he's going to be a very privileged patriarchal man. I mean, you get patriarchy gives those men who it elevates because patriarchy elevates some men over other men, white men over men of color, straight men over gay men. I mean, you know, so fathers over sons. I mean... And all men over women. So it says, you want to be one of these men, and you can have money and houses and cars and, you know. And, and women. And women. Endless women. Um, no you, real relationships, but a lot of sex maybe. Or the, or yeah. A lot of- and objects. You can have expensive watches. You can have beautiful clothes, handmade suits. You know, you can. And for women. If you stop saying what you're really feeling and thinking, if you don't say what you see and you don't listen to what you hear, but you say what other people want you to say, and you you know know what people want you to know, not what you know from your own experience, then people will want to be with you and you will be included and everyone will want you to be their colleague or their lover or their da-da-da. You start to say what you're, you, you really feel and think. No one will want to be with you. You will be rejected. Nobody will want to hang out with you. No man will love you. No man will love you even. And, you know, you'll be all alone. And So choose, you know. And I mean, I you know, in the Shakespeare play, The Tempest, Miranda, the young girl, the daughter of Prospero, the goddesses come and they offer her honor, riches, marriage, blessing. That's what women are offered in patriarchy. You just shut up, basically. Don't say what you see. Don't say what you know from experience. And you can have honor. Otherwise, you have dishonor. You can have riches. Otherwise, you'll be poor. You can have marriage. Otherwise, you'll be all alone. You know, it's, it's it, like... It also makes me think of this uh, of this uh, very famous tale of the little mermaid. Yeah. You well, can't... she has to sacrifice her voice. Her voice. Yeah, it's like, this is, <laughs> this In is order no to secret. Have, to have a, a man. Right. It's like, this is not a secret. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Everybody knows this. Okay. So, but, but still, I mean, without friendship, without real intimacy, one becomes crazy. Little boys know that. Teenagers know that. Right. Girls know that. Everybody knows that. Right. I mean, we need it. But when I look around me, I see a lot of men who don't experience any real intimacy with anyone. And I think they might be crazy. But at the same time, they seem perfectly adapted to the world we live in. They're very successful. They make a lot of money. They say they are happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they say that they don't lack anything, that they perfectly find the way they are. Mm-hmm. And so how can they have forgotten what they need? How can they not feel that? I mean, how can your theory explain this paradox of men being all alone, without intimacy and at the same time saying they're perfectly happy and being very successful and being very adapted to the world we live in. The first response to loss is protest. So you're saying, why aren't these men protesting? Well, let me say that our discovery was the protest is seen as 
no man would protest because a man doesn't need relationships. He's capable of standing on his own two feet, so forth. Um, so the protest gets shamed. It's seen as unmasculine. If the protest is ineffective, it's followed by despair. And then nobody likes to live in despair. That's what you're saying. Why aren't they despairing? Despair is followed by detachment and the replacement of people with objects. So this man says he has detached. He's not even conscious of missing relationships. It's not in his awareness. Instead, he says, look, I have all this success. I have all these things. I can have almost any woman I want. What did Donald Trump say? If you're enough of a star, you, you can, can get grab it. You can grab it. Yeah, you yeah. can do that. I can have lots of women, beautiful women. Why are... So, you, you know, what you're saying is, I mean, as a psychologist... What people say is only one level of what's going on. I mean, if I, as a psychologist, you know, you have, for example, because women's anger is seen as such a problem, you have a lot of women who say, I'm not angry. And it was really funny when I was doing my work with girls. They, I remember this one girl, she was Indian. She was terrific. And she was talking about conversation with her mother. And she said to her, Mom, are you angry with me? And then she'd imitate the mother's voice saying, I'm not angry. And, you know, she knew the mother was angry. And the mother was saying she wasn't angry. So, you I, know. I remember, I, I remember a lot of scenes like that. Like um, when I went to live in the U.S. to study, I remember one of my roommates who really didn't like me to do a lot of things. Like I was just smoking cigarettes, so I was doing a lot of things, but she couldn't tell me because she was so used to be just nice and pleasant. And so I remember, I was like, is, there, is, is it anything, is there anything wrong, Jen? And she was like, no, with a, with a very big smile. She was like, no, everything is fine. Everything is fine, Victoire. And I could, I knew, I knew something was wrong, you know, but she could not tell me. And it happens a lot. I'm going to tell you back a very funny boy story. The mother told me the story. So a mo a, this is a mother of a five-year-old boy. And this is my point about boys being emotionally intelligent. So if you see a man who seems emotionally clueless, you have to say, what happened to this person? Anyway, because so he, he used to be, because any man you see used to be a very smart and emotional, emotionally smart young boy. Exactly. Well, the, as a human being, because we are, as human beings, very emotionally sensitive. Yes. Yeah. Now, I can tell you one of the things I learned in my research was that there's a cover voice and there's a voice underneath. There's a patriarchal voice that we all learn of how to navigate a patriarchal institution or environment, and then there's a human voice underneath. And my first you know, experience of this came from a woman who I asked her to solve a moral dilemma. I was doing research, and she looked at me and she said, would you like to know what I think? Or would you like to know what I really think? Meaning she learned to think in a way that was different from the way she really thought, and she was aware of the difference. So, you know, what I learned from my research is <laughs> in a patriarchal culture, a human voice gets covered by a patriarchal voice. So when you hear the patriarchal voice, it's important to hear how much cultural resonance and support it has, but also to ask, Where is the human voice? After reading your book, I was wondering, like, does love exist anywhere, really? I mean, if we, if women learn how to be uh, authentic, if men pretend that they don't need anybody, then, I mean, in, in heterosexual couples, how, how does it work? I mean, is it, is it real love? Is it fake love? What is it then, the relationship they, they have? See, but you forget about one thing. Resistance. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know we that. can resist. Yeah, so you can say, unless you resist, you will not have love. I would like us to discuss how we can all get out of this trap collectively and in, you know, on, on an individual level. I mean, how can men as adults relearn What they've, what they have unlearned when when they were kids. So Is I there have things they can do. Yes. What can they do? Hang around with four and five year old boys. 
Is that the solution? It's well, you said, how can they get back in touch with some part of themselves they lost? And when I was <clears throat> doing the research with boys with Judy, I observed the fathers. This was in the 1990s, so these men were in their 30s. Some of these fathers bringing their little boys to school, they were so tender with these boys and playful and so forth. So I said to these fathers, the group of them, would you meet with me and talk with me about what it's like to be a father of a four- and five-year-old boy? So they did. We were planning to meet once. We ended up meeting for the whole winter. And at one point I said to these men, what do you see in your son that leads you to say, I hope he never loses that? And they said his, how emotionally out there he is, how his emotions are so available, how his spunk, how lively these little boys were. And another one said, the real joy he has in his friends. So then here was the question. As their boys grew up, would they have they wanted their boys to hold on to these qualities, but they wanted their boys to be men. So that was the dilemma for them. Could they support these qualities in their boys without exposing their boys to being beaten up or called like girls or called or gay? To be bullied or all those things. Mm -hmm. So my first step would be I would require all men to spend some time with four and five year old boys. And or girls. No, well, boys. well, just because for boys it raises the dilemma of, mm -hmm. I would ask all women to spend time with nine, ten, eleven-year-old girls, and then to ask themselves, what do they need to do to protect these human qualities in these children that they themselves value, but which they them and because a lot of these men seeing these qualities in these boys realized that they, the men, were having trouble in their intimate relationships because they felt they had to cover these qualities or sacrifice them. So first you have to recover what has been, what is inside of you, but you have put out of your awareness. And that's so, a good way to do it. And then you have to take action in the society to change what I would say simply join the healthy resistance of the child to losing these basic human capacities, these very valuable human capacities. Of empathy. Empathy. What the neuroscientists, to keep your thoughts and feelings connected, and cooperation. You join the resist and you educate the resistance of the children. I mean, you don't have to bring, you don't have to import anything. It's already there. It's like saying... You know, you, you're a parent of a child. <clears throat> you give the child healthy food because you want to strengthen the child's immune system. Well, you have to do that psychologically because the child encounters a toxic culture, which is patriarchy. And you have to strengthen the child's resistance, ability to resist this culture. And I think you have to deal with the culture. So you have to deal with the schools and you have to deal with all the institutions that are basically, you know, in a sense, forcing that sacrifice. Or, But how can you do as parents? I mean, I don't have kids myself, but I imagine, I mean, I mean I, I'm listening to my friends who have, who have children and they say, you know, I, I'm trying to show my little boy that it's okay to be tender, it's okay to be, it's okay to cry, it's okay to say how you feel. But at the same time, my little boy is going to school now, and now he comes back, and he, when he comes back from school, he's obsessed with weapons and, and fighting, and, and, and I don't recognize him, and I don't know what to do. Well, I think you have to say this, what's going on in school is real, and he has to navigate this. I mean, you can't <laughs> wave a wand and change the world. But you can help him to figure out ways that are not cost, too costly to navigate this. And meanwhile, you can go to the school and say, how come you're supporting a weapons culture here? Yes. I mean, one of the things that's amazing to me, or was amazing when I was doing this work, is that the teachers at the schools don't intervene when girls are being, for example, mean to each other. It's almost like the adult women get paralyzed. And, you know, and you would think you might say, stop it. You can't treat people this way. Or, you know, what is this with all these weapons? What are you fighting? Let's talk about what's going on here. I mean, you know, if you're an educator, you, this is what you should be doing. 
Yeah, if you're a man, maybe you can spend more time with little boys, observing them, how they are authentic, how they express their feelings. And maybe, I guess the advice for men would be to, as a man, you can also become more aware of other people's emotions and feelings. Yeah, and to say, wait a minute, within you, as a human being, you have this ability, what happened to it? And I think the thing you have to think about is as you get in touch with that part of yourself as a man, you're going to feel your masculinity is on the line. And you're going to feel maybe you're going to be shamed as a man. So you, how do you deal with that without becoming then violent and so forth and so on? So I think that both men and women, if you're talking about men and these changes in men, have to think about this change is going to expose initially men to feelings of shame about their masculinity. They're going, If they achieve their masculinity by um, shielding their tenderness and their sensitivity, then to recover that is going to feel like they're going to lose their masculinity. So you have to, it's what you're doing, Vic, why you have to talk about masculinity. And why is masculinity defined you know, in this binary way as the opposite of whatever is feminine or is in opposition to being feminine. So you can't, you, if you're going to be masculine, you can't have any of the human qualities that have suddenly been called feminine, like tenderness. What at work would you like to recommend to our listeners? It could be a song, a movie, a painting, anything you want. Yeah, I want to recommend a movie. And actually, I would like to recommend three movies. I don't know. Great. <laughs> and I, I have to tell you, I wrote a piece called In a Different Voice, Act Two. And it's about three movies made by men that basically are showing men speaking in what I called a different voice, meaning a non-patriarchal voice. And these were very interesting to me because they were made by straight men. But they were also made by straight men who were living in long relationships with strong, outspoken women. So I think they were men who had had to confront what we've been talking about, about masculinity, because all of these movies deal with this issue. So the first movie is Phantom Thread, and the director is Paul Thomas Anderson. The second movie is First Reformed, and it was directed by Paul Schrader. And the third movie was Black Klansman, and it was directed by Spike Lee. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Les Couilles sur la Table is a podcast produced by Binge Audio. We are based in Paris, France. Quentin Bresson was the sound engineer for this episode and it was edited by Camille Regache. I'd love to know what your thoughts are after this conversation, so if you'd like to share them, you can always send me an email at lescouillessurlatable at binge.audio. Thank you. Bye. Bye.